Hello everybody, thank you so much for coming today, this is lovely. Um, you are um, a small and perfectly formed group of people, we're very delighted that you're here with us. Um, to talk to this amazing panel, um, there are sort of two, two worlds here of revolution and protest. We have um, the uh, actual Greenham women who are the subject of an amazing film for show trailer of the minute called Mothers of the Revolution. Um, and we're going to talk to, to them and I will let them tell you more about themselves because I did make the mistake once of starting to introduce a panel of green women who then immediately said, I think we can talk for ourselves, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> so I never made that mistake again. Um, <laughs> it wasn't was my review, I have to say. No, no, no. <laughs> I was going to ask. No, no. I'll, I'll tell you later, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, yeah, it, was, it wasn't working, was it? I was right. Ah, oh, there we go. Dulcet tones. Um, could you hear me okay anyway? So I don't need this to be terribly close to it. Fab. Um, and then we have um, the subjects of an upcoming film that's been funded by the BFI's uh, youth strand um, of filmmaking and projects, which is called Protest. So we've got Revolution and Protest. See what they did there? Um, and uh, they are, again, I'll let them explain themselves to you in a moment. Um, but they have been on, um, for all, um, a, lot, a lot of the people in this room uh, have, have a connection to Greenham. And the younger people are, are part of that there because they uh, came on a, a kind of recreate, a celebration that we, we, we recreated recently, which I'll tell you about in a moment. But that's to do with me. Um, so just a very quick temperature gauge. Hands up if you do, or when I'm saying Greenham and Greenham Common Women's Peace Camp, you know what it is that I'm talking about. Absolutely fine to not know. Brilliant. Okay, so some parents here, very well briefed. Excellent. And a boy and a boyfriend of mine, obviously up on it. Great, fantastic. <laughs> um, so if I are there, is there people here to whom it is brand new information? Fantastic. Okay. This will be um a whistle-stop tour that I hate doing in front of actual Greener women, but to, to, to very briefly summarise what, what it was, uh, it was a, a, a women-only, non-violent direct action camp that was set up 40 years ago last month uh, by a group of women who were appalled that we were going to have American cruise missiles in this country in order that America could better fire at Russia and Russia would then fire back to Europe, North America, and it would take about 10 seconds later for America to be annihilated because we'd have gone first. Just a bonkers plan. Um, if there was, and this is during the Cold War, if there had been any of it. So a group of women from Wales walked all the way from Cardiff to Greenham Common where these missiles were gonna end up. And they, they all they wanted was a dialogue. That's, that's 110 miles, so it's really, tiring I can tell you why I know in a minute um, and uh, and they and they didn't get listened to so like the suffragettes they chained themselves to the fence they stayed lots and lots of women from the second wave feminist movement from the peace movement from all over the country came and joined them and then they just stayed women then came from all over the world and joined them these women went all over the world talking about nonviolent violent direct action talking about creative protest keeping their making their statement at this camp where these missiles absolutely had no legal right to be um, and until the missiles went and this land this this common which is the last piece of common one of the last pieces of common land was given back to the people we can all go there now and enjoy it um, and it is the biggest female-led and and largely female only um, protest since suffrage it touched the lives of thousands of women because a lot of women lived there some of them all year round in the you know, mud and winter and all the rest of it, um, experiencing state violence and all sorts of things, as well as lots of local support and all sorts of local criticism. So there's a lot going on. And then they would hold big actions and 30,000 women and girls would arrive before mobile phones, before the internet. Uh, and and I was, my mum took me when I was little and we held hands around the nine mile base and hugged the military into the internet's life. Um, yeah, so anyway, and I think rocked down quite a lot of fence as well. So there was, it, there's so much more we, we could say about it, but what you should probably do is hear from these people and and hopefully this trailer that we're going to show will also tell you about it because the exciting thing is rather than me waffling on about it, there is now a, a film that you can watch. It's one of several um, documentaries that have been inspired by the um, by the anniversary. There's one that's coming out on the Arte channel as well um, later this year uh, by a French director because this has inspired women all over the world. Let's have a look at the trailer now because one of its, one of its stars is, is a monsters. There was this four minute warning the government would give if there was a nuclear threat. Four minutes to find her children, to say goodbye. 
We knew there was this place called Greenham Common with foreign missiles on our soil. We had to do something. We knew we were crazy, but we had to do it. All these women with one purpose had come together. This is the story of the ordinary women who helped end the Cold War. The arms race was between two powers. You can't just focus on one without looking at the other. It's a dance. I said, I think we should go to Russia. There was this group in the Soviet Union. They were the Russian counterparts of the Greenham women. The government and KGB consider us dissidents. And there's a car behind us with all these guys just looking at us. I've never had a tail before. That was the first time when I was really scared. There are consequences. I thought about my children. For a moment, you thought that you'd failed. We have to bring it back to the nuclear weapons. Whatever campaign we had, we'd started it, and it had to continue. You can't just stay at home. You have to go so as to lend power. We, take we were much, much closer to nuclear war than with the Cuban Missile Crisis. The risks of doing nothing were greater than the risks of doing something. If you want to change something in the world, then you just go ahead. Don't wait for directions. If you always do as you're told, then you don't ever change anything. Power. These women Power. changed our future. So, really exciting stuff. And as I say, it's the 40 year anniversary, so now is the time to immerse yourself in this. I'll do a quick introduction. I run a project, I co run it with a group of really awesome women called Green and Women Everywhere. Um, and the thing we did this year, we've been, in fact, this is a book that highlights it, shameless plug, uh, but yeah. we've interviewed over 200 Green and Women to make sure their stories aren't lost. Um, and this year we recreated the march and walked with young people like this and the Green and Women themselves, all the way from Cardiff to Greenham. I haven't seen you since then, have I? It's nice to see you again. And you, Rebecca, we were on the common last time I saw you. Yes. Um, this is pictures of the march, courtesy of Darren. And you'll see some of our, our young women up there. So that's why I've been asked to come here today, uh, because I have either w walked in the footsteps of, of giants like Rebecca uh, with amazing young protesters and activists, or I have interviewed amazing people like Elizabeth. So that's me. I will now hand, uh, I'll hand, I'll start at this uh, I'll start with you, Rebecca, because I think it's, it does centre the... You bring it all together, I think. Can I ask you to quickly introduce yourself and your relationship to Greenham? So I'm Rebecca Johnson. I'm the voice that you hear giving the narration. I'm not sh shown on that, but I am shown on the, on the film. Um, and I lived at Greenham Common for five years. I didn't do that walk uh, from Cardiff to Greenham because I was actually going the other way. I'd been teaching for two years in Japan. And I had gone on to, and I was coming back to London to, to study at SOAS uh, <coughs> on the Trans-Siberian. So I went right through Russia and East, East Germany and literally took the train, um, very climate safe, I'm going to go all around about this. <laughs> <You're right. laughs> and, um, and so I knew that these were people just like us. But I only started going down to Greenham when it became a women-only peace camp um, and uh, really dedicated it, it, to empowering women from all over the world to release our creativity, to make the changes that were necessary to make. To, we were taking on, you know, the US, the Soviet Union, the, the, the British government as well, <laughs> uh, headed by Margaret Thatcher, you know, who were pro-nuclear weapons and who were deploying this new generation of nuclear <coughs> weapons. And so we didn't, you know, the orthodox view of being, you know, was passive resistance. And, uh, and we had a lot of women coming to Greenham, actually, who'd experienced a lot of violence uh, long before they came to Greenham, in, you know, from, from family to, to, you know, street violence. Of course, that's all in, we're now recognising again. We haven't stopped that. Mm -hmm. And we have to take that on in everything we do, just as we have to take on climate in everything we do, which is today's kind of other extinction threat. But of course, we, we did, what Greenham did in, during the five years that I was there was get Gorbachev and Reagan to do the treaty, what became known as the INF Treaty, Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty. 
And at that point, I mean, I'd, I'd been there five years. I'd, I'd gone through a lot. I was a absolutely exhausted. But, um, you, you know, so I actually took it as, as, as my chance to leave and, and, and to, to remake my life. Um, we'll, we can talk a little bit more about that. But I brought the point in about the, the violence against women because what, one of the things that Greenham did was we developed what we called feminist nonviolence which was um, a very, very active form that wasn't just symbolic. It was transformative of, for us. It confronted the police and the violence and the soldiers and the military and the weapons, but without using violence in any way against them. <clears throat> and that was the key thing that was so important to us that we disrupted the base. And that's what the, the film just shows, all the many, many, many different ways because we, don't, we weren't just about symbolism, we wanted to stop them bringing the nuclear weapons in. And we wanted to disrupt and stop the nuclear weapons then going out on the public roads. So we had, and that's what I call feminist nonviolence. And when I first heard about kind of the climate actions and, you know, listened to Greta and, and then, you know, got involved in, the, in, in not the first, but the second XR, and then just stayed to be, you know, all sorts of things like a legal observer. And, there were all these young women and some young men too, together using feminist nonviolence, very actively disrupting. And I was so excited to see what you were doing and had the privilege of meeting both of you during the Greenham weekend uh, for the 40th anniversary. And uh, I'm just so delighted to be sharing this panel with you again. <laughs> yes, we <can. laughs> have. And then uh, uh, next to Rebecca, we have Elizabeth Woodcroft, who is now a very marvellous novelist. But could you tell us your link to Greenham in your previous life? In my previous life, I was um, a member of a radical set of chambers. Uh, I became a barrister in 1980, which was just about the time that Thatcher was beginning to flex her muscles. And so uh, in our chambers, we were representing quite a lot of different people as time went by. We, we represented striking minors, um, anti-apartheid demonstrators, all sorts of, uh, all the right people um, <laughs> who were, you know, who were subject to injustice. And then, uh, and I've been involved in, in uh, CND, the Campaign for Nuclear Disarmament, since I was 12 and going on the marches from Aldermaston. And I, um, our mum wouldn't let us go on the march until we were 12 because she didn't want people to think we'd been indoctrinated. <laughs> and so we had to wait. And I, although I wanted the bomb to be banned, I didn't want it banned before I was 12. So, because I wanted to go on the march. Anyway, um, strangely, I, I was lucky in that respect. Uh, be careful what you wish for. Um, anyway, I became a barrister. I'd been working for women in, in women's aid. And so I, uh, after I'd been working there, I became a barrister. And then Greenham Common happened and the women began to do these extraordinary things, embracing the base, going into the base, uh, occasionally cutting the wire. But the first thing, I think the first time that I... That was later, wasn't it? Yes. Uh, that's another story. The first time I was involved, I think, was after dancing on the silos. No, you... If I can just correct you. She was my lawyer on my first arrest, which was <laughs> occupying the sentry box. <laughs> which is a wonderful scene in the film. It is so funny. These women who are in this sentry box, the sentry box of the base, where there are nuclear warheads, and the phone rings. And somebody answers and says, hello. And it's a Greenham woman. And, and somebody says something like, who's that? And it's always oh, just the Greenham Women's Peace Camp. Click. <laughs> Which is a wonderful scene in the film. Anyway, um, so they did that. I, and I, was, I got a call, um, I think in the middle of the night or early in the morning, to say, can you go down to Newbury Magistrates Court and represent some women? And uh, there were loads of them. They were all these women, and the court was lay magistrates. They didn't know what to do uh, with all these wonderful women who had very clear ideas about what they wanted to do. And so it began, and I, I did several of the cases at Greenham. Well, but anyway, I'll just say they were brought before the court initially for breaching the peace. That's not a criminal charge. 
But of course, the mad thing is they were keeping the peace by, you know, stopping uh, nuclear proliferation, as you do at, you know, Newbury Magistrates Court. They didn't know what they were up against. And we did <laughs> developed because the women did such wonderful and extraordinary things. I mean, they really did go out at night and try and stop these uh, practice runs through the uh, lanes of Berkshire, wasn't it? And, you know, with nuclear, they, they had yeah. nuclear warheads. Yeah, they, they, and, they were war games. And the women, the women, the green women, were doing things like putting sugar in the petrol tanks. Yeah. Well, <laughs> the, I, mean, are good. Um, I mean, how dangerous can that be? You know, how brave. I'm just a lawyer. I just had the books and, you know, um, I did take my mum to Green and once and she had a cup of herb tea. Never again. But apart from that, <laughs> it was all to the good. But uh, I'll stop oh, now. I'll stop. Oh, <laughs> and I just, she, did, she was our barrister for the dancing on the silos, but that was the second okay. action. <laughs> and I just, you know, because you... No, chronology is so important. From the first action, because you represented... I was one of the people you represented. Whereas in the silos action... A lot of you represented a lot of women, but other but I women. To represent There's so myself. many stories, but but you must yeah. see the film. It's all in the film. It's lovely. But anyway, yeah, no, lovely. And what what Elizabeth hasn't said because she's being being modest uh, is that you you your team and you came up with the idea of the self defence defence, didn't you? Of the genocide act. Yeah. Yes. So, well, I have to say, I was on the tube one day, and a, a very friendly radical barrister was on the tube with me, and I was saying. Oh, I'm doing this case at Greenerman. Just trying to think of something, you know, how can we defend it? What can we say? And he said something like, what about genocide? And so it became the, right. the, the defence that we used yes. was that the women were behaving uh, in a way that was self-defence to protect themselves or others, their families, their children, from the offence of genocide, and that is a valid defence, and indeed it was a valid defence <laughs> until later, and I will come back to that possibly. Yes, but lovely. hey, at the Perfect. moment. Perfect. Lovely. <laughs> and then we have uh, Xanthi uh, and Poppy. Xanthi, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. Hi, I'm Xanthi. Um, I'm a young activist, um, so I do quite a lot of activism for the climate and stuff, so I was involved in Extinction Rebellion as well, like himself. And um, I set up a local youth group in my area um, for young people in Exxon um, to get involved in actions and stuff like that. And um, I've done other stuff as well. I've been quite involved in the Black Lives Matter movement, uh, especially like last year when things kind of got big. And um, I joined an organisation who were doing protests uh, every week on a Sunday um, called All Black Lives UK and I do a bit of performance poetry and stuff so I would perform poems and stuff like that and yeah I was um, quite part of that movement um, and reading my stuff and sharing the message um, so yeah that's kind of me and my involvement with Greenland um, was through a document a different documentary called um, Protest I think and we are three yeah, no, well, there's another one of us. Actually. It's lovely Evie, who couldn't be here today, who's yeah. great as well. Um, and we were kind of learning about Greenland and our feminist, like, like protest history and non-violent direct action, which is really interesting, but especially being part of XR, where it's like, where do these things stem from? And it's not really talked about. Um, and that's very much like the, the strategy that they use, um, which is, yeah, so it was amazing to learn about that. And so I joined them for the... Might be able to see me there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just subtly. <laughs> 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 um, yeah, so I joined them for the 40 um, year anniversary march. Um, yeah. Oh, that's that's awesome. March, <laughs> some marching happenings and walking and chanting as well. Yeah. That's the Seven Bridge. Oh, oh that's amazing. amazing. Look at that. That's a great photo. <laughs> <laughs> that's a little Susay with you there, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. That's another green woman who's, uh, again, they're all, they're, there's a lot of fascinating okay, women. Um, I think she's Yellow Gate Clearing. She was a yellow gator, but, but in the clearing. She talks about herself as a Yellow oh, Gate okay. Clearing woman. Oh, okay. So like a little bit that was off to the side oh. of the trees. <laughs> kind of 
She said we were young and uh, um, naughty, is how she describes the clearing. <laughs> all the, and I'm all like, what, green and women who are naughty? You must have really stood out from all the other green and women <laughs> who were there to be extremely good and well-behaved. <laughs> um, Poppy, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, definitely. Hi, everyone. My name is Poppy. Um, like Xanthi, I'm a young activist. And my journey into activism was a little bit odd. You can see me above in the green and robe with a dove. I was living my best life. Um, but my journey into activism happened because I've always been quite an over-opinionated, bossy young woman. Um, and I grew up, grew up in a very working class city. So I was seeing the effects even today of oppression that we still live through, whether that be period poverty or things like benefit cuts, I've seen it. And so I soon began to realize that a lot of the inequalities we faced are linked and they all impact one another and are all on a massive spiral of oppression to you know give men and the rich more power um, and it really annoyed me so I began to focus on climate activism like Xanthi and I'm really proud to be chair of the Youth Climate Ambassadors for Wales mm -hmm. so I currently have a very mm -hmm. weird relationship where I work with the UK and Welsh government to kind of advise them and push them into making more climate policy and to represent young people I also work with a group called Climate Cymru which is aiming to represent Wales and young people at COP26 at Glasgow um, and I do a lot of community work and worked on girls rights i work with plan uk to combat things like period poverty sex education and to really amplify women and to make sure that women are heard and that's how i had the pleasure of getting involved in this green in march and for me even though it was only like a month ago this march really changed my perspective on myself and my perspective on the world i began to realize properly the power that women actually have when we work together and i began to notice how society tries to split women apart and tries to undermine female history because when women work together, they can do incredible things as we've seen through Greenham. So I've had the privilege and the pleasure to be involved in this project and to really funnel my activism through it. And it's been amazing. Um, so yeah, it's great to be on this panel and be with these amazing women again. <laughs> Round of applause for both Santi and Poppy. I realise we didn't give you an individual round of applause, but we will be... Yeah, I've absolutely. asked um, Xanthi if she would do one of her protest poems for oh, us before we finish. Yes. So, which you will have... I mean, yes, they stay with powerful. you, don't they? So, um, so you'll get a chance for another round of applause as well. You very much deserve it. That was a joint one, but you deserve... You both deserve your own as well. Um, I do... I, I actually covered quite a lot of ground that I wanted to talk about in my questions. I have, I have questions, um, but I also... There are people here, and you may well have questions, and we only have uh, a certain amount of time. So I'm actually wondering, um, you've, you've heard a lot of fascinating stuff. I would love to know if there's anything you would like to ask these women. If you don't, I have a couple more things I would like to ask them. But, but it, yes, fantastic. Please ask away. That's a really interesting question because I also actually had a question. I think that the laws that, that this bill takes to the next level was, was some of them are put in place to deal with the Greenham women, are they not? Well, they, they, that sort of, is there a trajectory, is my question, I suppose. I think there is a trajectory, and, and Liz can probably talk more about that, but I, to answer your question, we have to protest it. We really have to mm -hmm. stop <clears throat> that legislation coming in because it's designed to turn non-violent protesters who are exactly wanting to defend themselves, their families, everyone they love, and the planet against annihilation, against extinction mm -hmm. from either nuclear weapons or uh, climate. Those are the two big things. This is not, you know, we're not the terrorists. Mm -hmm. It's the military industrial business as usual, ba backed by laws that are now, and if you start treating nonviolent protesters as terrorists, then you know th then what what happens is you 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 both you you criminalize democratically <clears throat> needed protests mm -hmm. now when we were first being being charged you know my my first couple of arrests the sentry box followed by the silos as liz said they used a 600 year old law we were talking about nuclear weapons and they did us under breach of the peace and of course we had an answer we're keeping the peace and that one is even is civil but we went to prison for it because we made the choice not to sign something 
that said we would leave green and not we would we would be you know we would not bound do this over. again. You'd be and bound. It's basically over. a law against sort of you know violent drunk and whatever you know me, you know hooliganism or noise or whatever whatever the government wanted it to be about. But over the years, it has refined down down more and more, and I think it's profound. This latest one is the worst of all yeah. mm -hmm. because it doesn't deal with any of you know any violent terrorists. Because actually, there are laws that already do that. It's using that kind of of othering of you know that, that, that trying to make us look like that. That's what they did in the in, in the eighties with the film. And I do encourage you to see the film. It was on yesterday morning here, and I don't know if they're still going to show it again here. But the way that they tried to make open up for the the. the, the to open us up for violence. Well, also, if they if they start calling us non-violent protesters, terrorists, mm -hmm. they also unleash violence against us. Yeah. yeah. It makes it permissible. And it, so it makes yeah. it permissible. And that is what happened in the in the 80s as they, but when, the way they did it then was they kind of vilified us as lesbians because this was a <laughs> really toxic um, uh, time of, 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 of gay bashing and, and, and quite a lot of us you know, face violence, but all green and women face violence because the media put that on us. But now, this law, and this is where I'll stop, is actually putting terrorism, terrorists, labeling us terrorists. And this will make particularly young women, but all of us, much more vulnerable mm. to being attacked when what we're actually trying to do is, 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 is save the world. Yeah. Yeah, I think I was going to say, I think it further. What this kind of bill does is it further oppresses the people that have already most oppressed them, especially mm -hmm. because it's the police. So say with like Black Lives Matter movements, um, I feel like it's one of the worst things to happen because it's gonna further oppress the people that are already being oppressed by the police and already face more violence from the police. Um, and yeah, and it's taken away our like fundamental right mm -hmm. to be able to have a voice. And um, for many people, that is the way that they can have their voice um, is taken to the streets not a lot of people can get inside these yeah. places and that's that is what that is how change is created um, and they know that that is just like oh yeah we'll put something about noise and it's just yeah it's ridiculous yes. that's what I think can I add to this yes, okay and um, I think the bill is disgusting I think it makes me feel really ashamed to be you know run by a government that thinks that that's acceptable <coughs> um and I think like Zampi said it's a way to continue to oppress people and to belittle people and to make us feel like our opinions are wrong or don't matter but on the other hand of that I think that shows us how powerful we are because when a government is that afraid of what happens when we join together and we unite to protest against them I think it shows how scared they are of what might happen when people begin to collect together and realize their opinions and realize what is wrong in our society and fight against that mm -hmm. so I think whilst passing this bill is disgusting and oppressive and such a violation of our rights if anything it's empowering to know that they're that afraid of our opinions mm -hmm. and for me personally it just pushes me to want to keep showing them my opinion and my voice and showing them when they're wrong and protesting against policies and against lack of climate action etc that will oppress us even more in the long run so i think the bill is awful and a really massive step back but we need to make sure we spin it to make sure that it reminds us of how powerful we are because they're that afraid of what's going to happen when people see us and listen to us great um, so i was asking you um uh, yeah, do you see a trajectory from the way that, because I know I was fascinated when I, interviewed, when I interviewed you about how the Green and women used the law and and used it just to put their own take on, on their story and get a platform. But equally, the law and the, and the bastion of, of the law and, and, and the legal world also learned and put more and more laws in place to criminalise more and more things that the Green women were standing for. Am I right about that, Elizabeth? Talk to us a bit about Well, I, I, I mean, I think... The, the government of the day were, you know, were terrified actually by the Green and women. And, and I think, I mean, just picking up on what Poppy said, I think when you have such a big challenge as this new change in the law, what the Green and women were doing was finding new ways of um, protesting. I mean, and now, you know, the world has changed since the 80s. Uh, we've got, uh, you know, the internet, we've got social media. And so there's all sorts of ways of getting the message out. But one of the things 
for example, that, um, that really touched the country. Because I think what you have to remember is that people really responded to Greenham. People loved the Greenham women. People loved the fact that women were out there doing this. Even though the Daily Express and the Daily Mail were just, mm -hmm. you know, were sort of talking about blanket wearing, wood fire, smoke smelling women roaming the streets of Newbury. Um, what actually was, was happening was that day after day, especially when those big cases came up, when there were 30 or 40 women in court, women were, were saying, no, I'm not going to be bound over to keep the peace. And the only thing then that magistrates can do is bind them over. And uh, sorry, is send them, if they won't be bound over, is send them to prison. And so day after day, prison vans were leaving Newbury Magistrates Court filled with women. And it was so powerful as an image. I mean, it must have been horrible for you. Um, but women were, well, first of all, it made a connection with the suffragettes. And everybody had a memory of how badly the suffragettes were treated. And then this was women. So in a way, you didn't care if people thought, oh, darling little women being taken to to prison. It was your message. You want, you know, women who are so determined to fight for peace that they will go to prison. Um, and I think that that's, I mean, that's the challenge for the, for the new generation is to take that law and to uh, expand it and find mm. ways of fighting against it and people will respond and then the government will have to do something because in the end, those nuclear missiles left the country. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, green and women won, and you will win too. So, you know, yeah. keep at it. You're, yes. We have to collectively win. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's the thing. And you're the generation. I used to think, call myself, I used to wear the suffragette ribbons and call myself suffragette, you know, the da a daughter of the suffragettes. And when I met you and we went round Aldermaston and Burfield, where the nuclear weapons are still being made for the UK, and and I met um, Xanthi, Poppy, and Evie then, and gave them a little tour around to show them that. And I, I, you, was, you asked such brilliant questions. You really got it. And I just felt, wow, you're green of daughters. <laughs> <laughs> um, just uh, on that point, there are a few cards on the chairs because there is a women's peace camp that meets every month at Aldermaston and has for, since Greenham, and it's still very much needed. If you can go, swell the ranks, take them food like people used to do for Greenham, you know, just just be hear what they've got to say. That is where we are still making our nuclear missiles. Where it's, that's where we make the stuff that we kill people with in other countries and that other countries buy off us. So you know, do do look at those little cards, take them with you, you know, um, get inspired by, by what the, what they're doing out there. Um, and I just. Um, I did an, uh, a radio programme, an archive on four, about Greenham called The Greenham Effect that came out the same weekend we were at the Common. And I interviewed for that Michael Heseltine, grudgingly. <laughs> His whole house is full of pictures of himself. Massive oil paintings. And there's a, anyway, a big house too. Anyway, that's beside the way. Michael Heseltine was the, sec the Secretary of Defence during the Greenham Common Cup. And he was put in place because they were winning the media war. And he was a, a real, before we knew the words, he was a real spin doctor. He's a very eloquent speaker. He's the kind of grand old man of the Tory party. And he, he was literally, I mean, he and Margaret Thatcher did not get on. You'll be surprised to hear he's not very keen on strong women. <laughs> um, I, I know, who'd have, gone, who'd have thunk it? Um, so they did not work well to it, but she, she gave him that terribly important position because he needed to win the media round. And it's very interesting when you talk to him that he, in one in one sentence, we'll say, "Oh, they they did nothing. It was fine." I turned that media around, thinking, "Oh, that right wing media. How clever of you! <laughs> <laughs> what what hard job you must have had." But anyway, but equally, he also knows that he will be open and say, "I got that job because they were winning the media war." So it is very interesting. They know it, even though they don't admit it, and they admit it, even though they don't. They, then the next sentence, they counter it. It's absolutely true. They they, they they were a force to be reckoned with, just like these women are today, and and, the, and these women still are. Your question. I'm so sorry. Thank you. Yeah, that's a very, a very interesting question. We also, we, we, we had to weigh everything up. What to do that would further the messaging that we would, you know, trying to convey and what not to do. But we couldn't be guided by whether or not we were popular in the media because the media, as we've just been talking, is actually, you know, the media is an... It should be an arm of democracy, and in some cases it is, but in a lot of cases, it's actually an arm of, of, of state 
authority. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, and some of it's very deliberate, as we found out, you know, from the defence correspondent in The Guardian in the film, uh, of a unit set up in the Ministry of Defence to, you know, and they actually had messaging to brand us burly lesbians instead of, you know. And then, you know, also, and of course we said, yes, we are, some of us. <laughs> you know. And then we get this other branding, which the film has, is Mothers of the Revolution. And it's like, well, not all of us were. Um, I was a mother of the Old Mastin Women's Peace Camp, actually, which we set up out of Green. So what I love about um, Internet Britain, which I think is, is taking the right kind of... Extinction Rebellion took the name Extinction Rebellion to describe exactly why they had to be the protests. But once that becomes too familiar, then you need other ways of messaging. Now, we all know that there is a demand going right across the country that how, how our homes, our offices, our buildings have got to be insulated because we mustn't use as much fossil fuel, you, you know, as we're, you, you know, as we've all been used to doing. So the very name, so that's a really creative way. So yes, they're sitting down in front uh, you know, on roads, but the roads and the traffic that goes on the roads is also part of the messaging. But the fact of taking the names, and I hope that more groups arise that don't only use the Extinction Rebellion name, but actually, we talked about Heseltine. I stood against Michael Heseltine in 1983 in the general election for Women for Life on Earth, which was the name that the, the group gave themselves who walked from Cardiff. And then the Green Party, which is called the Ecology Party, asked if I would stand for them too. So it was like Women for Life on Earth, Ecology. Well, yeah, that's what we stood for. Now, Heseltine was so scared of me that actually he refused to do any constituency debate at all with me. Now, a few, that meant in some cases that I didn't get invited, but the Rotary Club, very conservative, in Henley on Thames, <laughs> left an empty chair for Michael Heseltine because they were outraged that he refused, you know, to discuss this issue with me. And I was, had been asked to, Sad. So that's a creative thing, the protest. I think in the next election there's going to be, I think there should be a climate, mm -hmm. um, you know, somebody explicitly, like insulate Britons, and, you know, choose diff the various messages that you want for the climate, and then a whole bunch of you stand. I was only in my early 20s doing that. You know, do that because then the party name is the demand you're making. It doesn't matter how many votes you get. That's not the point of it. The point is to get the debate and get that kind of thing moving. And they can't stop you doing that in law, at least not, not, not yet. yet. <laughs> <laughs> and the other thing is it's really crucial. Always th think through, you know, the, the, the non-violence. When, you know, XR made, I think, a massive mistake of going out of the road, you know, blocking with the boats, uh, Oxford Circus and the boat, you know, all of that was beautiful and absolutely superb. And then there was the blocking of the Docklands Light Railway, which is not the most, you know, fossil. It doesn't, you know, that got the messaging completely wrong. It was daring do for the sake of daring do by a bunch of, I'm afraid to say probably mo blokes, that just wanted to do something action. No, every action has to have the right strategy. Mm -hmm. And also, we always strategize our actions going right through to the court cases so that the messages went through. And that's another thing that I think XR has not been quite as good at and I think needs to get better. Because if you're going to risk, you know, if you're going to be arrested and then risk going to prison, actually you want it to really matter. Mm -hmm. You want it to mean something and you want to call yourself something that the media cannot, um, ref you know, ca cannot make invisible. Yeah. And that's what I think is good about Insulate Britain. That's their title, so it goes all over, you know, can I, can I just say as well, um, you know, you had mentioned his time. He actually mentioned in his interview that he knew he was on the back foot being a man, that, that there was women and the whole Women for Life on Earth name and everything did have this weight that he couldn't, that he, that he felt like he was on the back foot about. Do you, do you, do, sorry, just quickly, um, do, do, you came on the march and that was female led, there wasn't only women there, but mainly women. Yeah. Do you feel that's changed how you, what you would like to see in activism going forward? Would you like more women only spaces? in your activism, not just in our world? 
Should I start? Yeah, yeah absolutely. I didn't realise how... I found that sometimes if I was in a meeting with predominantly men, I would perhaps slightly alter how much I speak or I would alter what I was saying or whether I was coming across as a bit too angry, you know. You don't want the men thinking you're angry. Um, but then when I was on this march and I was having conversations with people like Becca and I was forming all these opinions and just being really authentically and unapologetically myself, I realised sometimes because we do live in a patriarchy and because we do live under male oppression and stereotypes, how I was limiting myself and changing who I was. And something that I found really noticeable actually was we finished filming the documentary and then the day after I went straight back to school um, and I wandered into school and I was like, oh my God, this is so different. I was like, I haven't like had a political debate with someone in like 10 minutes. I haven't, you know, I was like, what is going on? Um, but I think because of that, women's spaces are really important. And I think it's important as well because society teaches us to compete against women. We're taught to see women as our enemies when actually Actually, when we work with women, really beautiful things happen mm -hmm. and it allows us to realise what's good about ourselves and it allows us to realise why we are important too. Um, so I think women-only spaces are definitely still relevant and essential because mm -hmm. I think in that two-week march, I probably changed more and found out more about myself than I would have perhaps in four years at a co-educational school. Wow. Which... <laughs> yeah. So thank you, Becca. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, no, I think women only spaces are really important and I think it was it was quite different for me to be in an activist space that was only women. And I think another reason that it's so important is because um, you need to have like every voice heard in a movement. And so say for, with climate activism and stuff like that, I think it's what people often forget is to think about the, the intersections mm -hmm. of, within our identities that um, will change how it affects us and change how we perceive it and change how... So say with strategy as well, how do you think about strategy that is open to everyone and that feels accessible to everyone? Mm -hmm. That can't always be done to say with XR. I know a lot of, uh, there's been a lot of discussion around the arrest, kind of go and get arrested and whatever. And obviously that's open to personal decision, but how do you make it so that it doesn't feel like it's further oppressing mm -hmm. someone else? So say as a mixed race black um, woman, I think about that kind of thing as well and how maybe that further puts me in a box and further oppresses me in that sense. Um, so I think it's really important in all kind of things to have those spaces where you can you can address these issues mm -hmm. and you can address them in a safer space. So with only women, that's what it felt. It felt more safe and yeah. it felt um, nurturing in a, the, way, the way that women listen to each other. And not always, but, <laughs> <laughs> but I think, yeah. So I think it is really important to have that and um, to address that and, yeah, to be able to then allowed to be for open discussions. Yeah. Can I just add to something? Because I think you made a really, really important point that at, at Greenham, we we didn't think through as much at, at the beginning that black women coming to Greenham faced a whole additional mm. layer yeah. of being targeted yeah. uh, with violence. And that, you know, just as we did take into account when you know, when we would have discussions that actually quite a lot of women said, I am not damn well going to lie down passively in front of some man, bailiff, police, soldiers, whoever. You know, I want to resist actively because I want to be, you know, passive resistance didn't empower women. And, and so we, we took all of that into account, but we didn't in those days take sufficiently into account that black women taking part in... Uh, you know, the anti-nuclear actions didn't just risk arrest, they risk a different kind of arrest and a different kind of treatment. And actually, so did working class women, I think. Mm -hmm. And that is shown in the film. You see that with, with, with Chris, one of the women that's very, very central in the film. And, um, and I, I kind of gradually was learning that, you know, through that. And after that, um, for example, when I'm actually wearing the Million Women Rise t-shirt, and the thing that I think is so brilliant about Million Women Rise was that when they started, they made clear that they were open to all women, but they were led by black women. Mm. So I went along to the first demonstration uh, as an ally, knowing that I was welcome there, but, you know, it's their, you know, mm. black women lead this. Yeah. And the next year, I was asked to be a steward, and so was my partner, Hina, who sat mm -hmm. there. Behind, who's a blue gator, by the way, from Green and Blue Gate. Um, <laughs> and, 
and from then on have been have, have done stewarding and anything they ask but recognizing that there need to be spaces also that black women yeah. can yeah. own mm -hmm. yeah. that you can act, you know that there, there can be meetings that are black women only mm -hmm. and it's not rejecting or mm. you know it's it's an empowering an, an empowering space mm -hmm. to talk about the issues you need to talk about and then you know we have meetings where we meet together and you know allies and Million women rise you know, we come as the stewards, we enable, you know, so that, and that kind of thing. Why don't more men recognize mm, yeah. that yeah, that true. was That's really true. all? Men were at Greenham all the time, actually. We only said, you can't stay after dark. You can't take part in the non-violent direct action. You can't take part in the actions, but you can take part when the missiles go out on the roads because they're going through your towns and villages. Mm -hmm. But it's still the obsession was about, why don't you let men in? Yeah. Mm. It wasn't about excluding men, it was about including women. Mm. And you know, and I, you know, I love being part of Million Women Rise, recognizing that it's about really empowering and including black women, yes. because they lead it. Mm -hmm. It is their movement, but they welcome us to support. Um, we're very nearly at time, which is very sad because there's a million more things I want to talk to you about. Um, I'm going to we'll go into like a, we'll finish with like a tiny talent section. <laughs> uh, it's almost like a sort of like a green a greenham talent when show and tell. Um, so I was thinking that I would I really want to um, check what um, I would like to know the focus of your novels, Elizabeth, since you stopped the law. I want to know what is on Rebecca's table there. I don't mean the cup and the bottle. <laughs> and um, I would love to hear Xanthi's poem. Um, and I could, if you want, if you've got time, if the room isn't needed, straight away, there's a Greenham song that I could teach, teach you that Rebecca will need no, no words for, but we could quickly learn. So let's start with Elizabeth. What, 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 is, what do you write about Greenham now in your novels? Or what do you? Well, I have written, I've published two novels two crime novels, my name's Elizabeth Woodcraft, um, <laughs> uh, and you can find them on Amazon. Um, and in fact, the first one I started writing, I did actually start writing about Greenham, but then I realized it was really complicated and it was gonna take ages. So it's sort of changed, um, but it's a crime novel. Uh, and um, my last two novels are actually about growing up as a working class girl uh, on a council estate and being a mod. So it's a lot of Tamla Motown and minis. But I should say that my heroine, Frankie, in, in my first two novels, uh, she likes Tamla Motown too. So there's some good music uh, throughout. So, you know, if you're worried about the music. But I do want to say, I want, I want Rebecca to tell us the story of the time she met who did she mean? Gorbachev. <laughs> Gorbachev, because that is very, very important, and I think it's wonderful. So Could do you tell. Do it while you're holding your 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 special your thing. Yeah, your go thing on. that you're going to tell that story. I'm actually not going to tell that story now, except because you you've now heard that I I met Gorbachev many <laughs> years later, and he and he paid tribute to 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 Green and Women as Green and Women and the Peace Movement of Europe. They edited my bit in, in, in that in the, in the film to cut out and the peace movement of Europe because they'd use that quote that I'd used for that. But he actually said it was the P it was Green and Women and the Peace Movement of Europe that uh, encouraged him to meet Reagan and that resulted in the treaty, which was the INF treaty, the 1987 treaty that was the first disarmament treaty, but it only got rid of some nuclear weapons, land-based cruise missiles on both sides out of Europe. So the thing that I'm wanting really, and I've got a bunch of copies of, is because after that, I was unemployable because I had a long criminal record. I couldn't go back to what I was doing. That is something, ch ch change your names. <laughs> <laughs> Free to People yeah. comes up quite Becky a bit in the archives. Gate is a very famous QC now. Yes. yes. Go figure, yes. she probably did, you know, <laughs> and quite a lot, anyway. But this She's is a judge the treaty. Now on the prohibition of nuclear weapons, so a full nuclear ban treaty. It was negotiated in the United Nations in 2017, after many years of, of, of rolling negotiations, but the final year, the president of the negotiations was the Costa Rican ambassador, Elaine White Gomez, who's just a star. 
And this is a feminist as well as a humanitarian treaty. And um, and I was... Um, I Go basically on, hold it. Pick it up. Pick it up. Pick it up. Do it, do it, do it. I, I co-founded the group International Campaign for... Um, to abolish nuclear weapons. I can, I can, we can, we all can, and we did. Um, <laughs> was um, uh, the, the Nobel Peace Pro uh, Committee in 2017 then awarded it to ICANN. And so I, as part of the steering group and one of its, its co-founders, we made them do 13 of these. Say it again, what it is. Nobel what is it's the Nobel it's Peace Prize. It's the Nobel Prize. Peace Prize. <laughs> I don't think any of us have even been in the same room as a Nobel Peace Prize, let alone carrying one around with them. And we chose two women, we collectively chose two women to go on the platform and receive it on our behalf, but, but a load of us were there in Oslo, as were the diplomats, uh, like Elaine, Ambassador uh, Elaine White Gomez, uh, to, to receive it. But the, but the thing about it is this is collective. Greenham actually got nominated and we said no because we just knew it was going to be, you know, it wasn't going to be the right thing for us. So when I was at the big weekend at Greenham yeah. doing the events there and one of them was a couple of hours where we got lots of different Greenham women telling different this is aspects recently of their story. for the anniversary. At the anniversary, 40th anniversary. Last month. I, had, I brought that down and I sent it round the whole the whole circle on, on straw bales we were outside the air traffic control tower that also features in the in the film, and um, and when it finishes, this man came up to me and he said, "Do you remember me, Rebecca?" <laughs> and I looked at him and I said, "No." And he said, "I was the desk sergeant at Newbury <laughs> Police Station. I remember you. Here's my wife who worked on the base as a caterer." So I met him and chatting to them, and somebody brought this back to me because I'd said, like, and he said. I don't know which is more astonishing, that you just handed out the Nobel Peace Prize for everybody to look at and take, you know, selfies and things, or that it came back to you. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, that's because it's green and women, and I knew that they deserve, you know, everybody who's ever worked to ban nuclear weapons, we still have to get this country to sign up, mm -hmm. but everybody is part of that, and that's all green and women, and it is all green and daughters oh. as well. Um, uh, I also um, was very moved on, on that celebration by the Newbury, uh, it was two different, a, a mayor and a, and a sub-mayor, two guys with bling, bigger bling and smaller bling, anyway, those guys, they actually apologised, they did official speeches, really? apologising to the green women, saying, I understand you weren't treated so terribly well last time you were here, and thank you for giving us our common back and everything you did. Well, That's I just great. Really, I missed the crucial thing that links this with the treaty. One of the women that we chose to uh, rep represent us to go on the platform was 13 years old, a schoolgirl in Hiroshima when the bomb was used. She's in the treaty. I did not know until the director, Brian March, of the, sorry, she's in the um, film. film, sent a photograph and said, is this Setsuko Thurlow? And I looked at it, and then I sent it to Setsuko and said, this looks like you, did you ever go to Greenham? And she said, oh yes, that's me. Wow. And so that's a connection. I got to know her many years later, and for 10 years worked closely with her on this treaty. I never knew that you and, both And did. you know, we chose her to make that connection. And then the other person we chose was a young woman, member of our staff, you know, our staff in Geneva, mm -hmm. because we wanted to say getting rid of nuclear weapons is also a, you know, a, a job for the next generation, not just... Well, you know, I just wanted to say... No, it's great. I'm, we, I'm glad you said it. I was just thinking, no, no, not at all. God, never. But I was thinking, on the note of the next generation, shall we, um, shall we have Xanthi's yes. amazing piece yeah. of performance poetry, if that's okay with you? Yes. To, to, to the acclaim of your own personal round of applause afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Remember. We scream so loud, cry in our shouts because you do not protect us, you arrest us, disrespect us, eradicate our voices until they're only noises, just a distant nuisance for the news threads to latch onto and name us the hurters when you hurt us. They still make us the threat and only believe us once we're dead. 
And still then they deny, say we lie, or say it's because we terrorised against the white man's lies. There's no time to cry, cause we have to fight to survive. While you kill our song and tell us our existence is wrong, we bleed for our rights. In our fight, do you try to shatter our light? Try to restrict our right to protest? You give us no rest. In justice, do we burn down the structures that tore us to shreds? Ignore those who bled. In each heartbeat, do our minds meet our tongues? In our lungs, do we search for a breath to fill the emptiness that infects us as our pain is normalised and we are left traumatised? We are the fighters of our sorrows, the fighters for tomorrow. From our knees do we scream that we will give them no peace until there's justice. Well, the whole point of this is obviously immerse yourselves in Greenham, immerse yourself in the revolution, Mothers of the Revolution film that is out now. Look out for protests when it, which will feature these amazing women. Look out for the Green Women Everywhere website and listen to the interviews of these amazing women. Find my book if you'd like to. <laughs> I know I keep trying to get you to, you beggar. <laughs> Can't speak that way to Rebecca Johnson. Okay, sorry, I was very rude to me. <laughs> yes, please, please can we have you in there? It would be very nice. You are in the book in song form. This, song the, form. the book has over, over 60, 60 different women's voices in it from the archive to weave together the story of the camp. And you, you're, there is a song of yours. So we proudly head up a chapter with your name, even though we couldn't get your... your is it? That's very nice. Um, but we want, because, because we want you, we all want to be work, protesting and changing the world together. You know, this is really important. So on that note, shall we just quickly, it isn't long, shall we do a Greenham song that you all to sing? And it's one of the most famous songs. And when we interview women about it, half of them go, if they were visitors, they go, oh, I loved this song. Just the beginning of this song and the smell of wood smoke takes me right back. And if women lived there, they go, oh God, that bloody song. Because <laughs> they had to hear it all the time. Um, but, um, <laughs> but you will know, yeah, and Rebecca, I think, will have that reaction, sadly. Um, it is, <laughs> it's called, oh, good, time, time, enough time has passed. It's called, um, you, she, it's either called She's Like a Mountain or alternatively You Can't Kill the Spirit. It gets kind of called both things. It's by Naomi Little Bear and it's fantastic. And it's on an album that, that you can, it's called um, We Have a Dream that Rebecca has worked, wrote many of the songs and is written with them, um, all has people like Colin Neer and Peggy Seeger and Frankie Armstrong on and the Green and Women made. And Pete Townsend Studio, I think, wasn't it? On Eel Pie Island, I know. Yeah, amazing. I had to ride my motorbike up to Pete Pie Island. I know, I know the place. Brilliant. So, um, so anyway, this is the song from that album that gets used a lot in process. It, it's fantastic. I'm going to teach you the chorus, okay? So... You can't kill the spirit. You can't kill the spirit. God, you sound lovely. <laughs> She's like a mountain. She's like a mountain. So beautiful. Old and strong. Old and strong. She lives on and on and on. She lives on and on and on. Beautiful. So I'll get, I'm not going to bother with the ukes. <laughs> but um, uh, but let's just go with the well, also the verses. Obviously, join in if you know them, um, and then all of you come in on those on those on those choruses. It's only two times. Nobody can push back an ocean. It's going to rise back up in waves. And nobody can stop the wind from blowing, stop a mind from growing. And somebody may stop my voice from singing, but the song will live on and on. You can't kill the spirit. She is like a mountain. Old and strong, she lives on and on and on. Nobody can stop a woman from feeling. She has to rise up like the sun. Somebody might change the words we're saying, but the truth will live on and on. You can't kill the spirit. She's like a mountain. 
old and strong. She lives on and on and on. Thank you to our panel. Thank you to these wonderful people.